Reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. You probably don't even have time to, to turn to it before I'll be done, but you can, you can try if you'd like to on page 221. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in every sin that clings so closely, and, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. In his book, Dare to be True, Mark Roberts tells of a friend who had made up her mind that she wanted to run a marathon. And even though Nancy had been a faithful jogger for many years, she had never tackled a full marathon and was kind of afraid to try. Well, someone had suggested that she join a track club where, where with the focused training and with the regular encouragement, why she be ready in no time to, to reach her goal. But it kind of made sense to her. So she joined a club that was near where she worked. But when she returned from her first workout and, and Mark asked her how it went, she said it was absolutely terrible. I must be the worst runner in the world. Man, the other people in the club were running three times as fast as I was. They bounded around the track like gazelles. I just kind of, kind of waddled. I, I think I should quit the club. But, but Mark tried to reassure her. He, he was saying, oh, come on now, Nancy. It, it can't be that bad. I mean, the first time you try anything new, you know it's going to be difficult. You, you know you're going to feel self-conscious. Just, just give it another try. I know it'll, it, it'll be better. So Nancy did. She, she went back. She, she gave it another try, but she came back feeling just as discouraged as the first time. Well, still, wanting to help his friend and, and wanting to be positive, Mark suggested that he go along the next time, just, just as a spectator. Perhaps he would be able to figure out what it was that just wasn't clicking for her. So he went along. And they drove over to the college where the club trained, and he saw the sign and immediately understood the problem. He said, oh, Nancy, oh, Nancy, this is the Santa Monica Track Club. How did they let you in? What do you mean by that, she sniped. Oh, Nancy, you don't understand. This track club is really top shelf. I mean, this is famous. This is elite. Its members include some of the fastest runners in the world. People who have won Olympic medals run here. I mean, compared to them, we would all look pathetic. Well, you know, that change in perspective really helped Nancy understand her situation. And she stopped comparing herself with, with the others. The coach, the other members helped and encouraged her. And being a part of the regular discipline of the club was, was very helpful. And she learned techniques from, from other members. And, and eventually, she did run a marathon. Now, she didn't come in first, but her time was really quite respectable, and, and she was happy with it. In, in this morning's scripture, 
the writer of Hebrews is making a comparison between running and our spiritual life. The chapter begins with the word, therefore, which is strange. I don't think any of us would write a chapter starting off with the word, therefore. Of course, the New Testament writers wrote what they wrote, and it wasn't for another thousand years that the chapters were superimposed onto the passages they had written. It wasn't for another 300 years after that that the text was divided up into verses. Many times, these chapter and verse divisions are very helpful. Sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, obviously, when a chapter begins with a therefore, it Beth Hoover's us to look back into the previous chapter to see what it is that we are thereforeing. So, when we check back into Hebrews chapter 11, we find a who's who of the great superheroes of the faith. By faith, Abel made an acceptable offering. By faith, Enoch walked with God. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed when God told him to leave his home for a new land that was being prepared for his descendants. And the chapter goes on to mention Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Moses, Rahab and Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel, who, and I quote, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Now, if we try to compare ourselves to those heroes of the faith, we might feel like Nancy, trying to run with Olympic medalists. Rather than feeling encouraged by their example, we might feel defeated, next to useless. Shut the mouth of lions? I mean, no thank you. That's not my spiritual gift. But we all, all of us, have our own race to run. We all have unique gifts, abilities, experiences, and interests that can be useful in the kingdom of God. Is God calling us to some special service? Are we taking that possibility seriously? Are we able to focus on it? Or are we simply consumed and distracted by all the busyness and the distractions of life? The story is told of a young Charles Darwin. One day, he was having a wonderful day, and he was eagerly holding a rare beetle in his right hand. And then he found another one, so now he had another rare beetle for his collection in his left hand. And suddenly, he caught sight of a third beetle that he knew he simply had to have for his collection. What should he do? What should he do? Well, thinking quickly, he opened his mouth, threw the first beetle in his mouth to, to hold it there while he grabbed the third with his free hand. Beetles have interesting defense mechanisms. And some of them are able to spray out a, a sort of foul acid. And sure enough, the beetle that was imprisoned in his mouth squirted out this awful, foul stuff so that it caused a fit of coughing. And as he was coughing and gagging, he lost all three beetles. <laughs> How easy it is to keep reaching for the things that we want 
and in the process somehow lose, lose what we have. The writer of Hebrews says that since we have the wonderful examples of these heroes of faith, let us likewise focus on the race that God has given us to run. Like a runner, we need to strip off everything that would hold us back. No more parasitic sins, no extra luggage, no lollygagging and sightseeing on the way, rather keeping our eyes focused on the track ahead, looking to Jesus who has already run and finished the course. Let us follow his example by keeping our purpose clearly in mind. Tom Peters' work, The Search for Excellence, uh, he mentions a couple of times in history when an, organizational's, an organization's purpose became misunderstood. It, it, it drifted, you might say, and ultimately led the organization astray. For most of the 1900s, the, the Swiss dominated timekeeping and the manufacture of really excellent watches and, and clocks. The Swiss took great pride in making the most precise gears and springs in the world. Their watches and clocks were masterpieces, and they controlled like 90% of the revenues made with the watchmaking industry. And then, in our lifetime, along came someone who developed the quartz movement with a liquid crystal display. Because it was electric, with, with no gears or knobs or springs or anything to take pride in, the clockmakers were really not interested in it. They failed to recognize that they were in the business of helping people tell time, rather than in the business of making the world's finest tiny precision gears. They lost their dominance in the industry. Their market share has dropped over 75%. Throughout the 1900s, the Kodak Company became one of the world's largest film and camera manufacturers, producing some of the most popular camera models of the 20th century, including the, the Brownie and the, the Instamatic, and of course, in, inexpensive cameras were made so that people could buy more of their film. They even had the, the slogan, a Kodak moment, which has entered into our language, describing an event that deserved to be recorded for posterity. Then along came the digital camera. In 2012, Kodak filed for bankruptcy. Now, they have since restructured and emerged from bankruptcy, but it's not the company, the world-dominating company that it, that it used to be. It has been said that if Sports Illustrated magazine had understood that it was in the sports information business, not the magazine publishing business. We would have a Sports Illustrated channel, not ESPN. What is the purpose? What is the goal, really? What are we trying to do? What is the purpose of this church? Is it to maintain the, the beautiful, historic properties and the historic traditions? Is it here in order to perpetuate the family traditions that we have grown up with? Is it our dream to have it become a destination for tourist buses who could stop and see how Welsh immigrants used to worship? Or for folks who want to prowl the cemetery looking for their dead ancestors. 
None of these things are bad things. But if we are going to call ourselves a, a Christian church, then we have to either go out into the world to serve in God's name or invite the world inside to hear the good news of God's love and forgiveness and direction for our lives. And if we forget that our purpose is serving or bringing people to God and helping them to grow as disciples, we will grow obsolete. Now, my old King James version of the Bible reads, run with patience the race that is set before us, which is kind of an unusual linking of two words that seem to suggest the opposite. I mean, when I hear the word patience, I think of sort of just be passive, just, just wait for conditions to change or, or improve. And so most modern translations, such as our Pew Bible, use the word perseverance, which suggests determination and, and pressing on and continuing the struggle rather than just wait around for conditions to, to change. We are to persevere, and improvement requires self-discipline. It requires self-control, not just sitting on a bench waiting for things to change. The average Olympic athlete trains four hours a day, six days a week, for six years before arriving at the Olympic competition. Getting better begins with working out every day. And yes, of course, there will be setbacks, there will be interruptions, there will be disappointments. And even as we look at our scripture, we see that from the beginning to the end, there are both good times and bad times for God's people. Sometimes there are joyful times. Other times there are just horrible, bone-crushing times. But the outcome, the victory, is never in doubt for the person who looks ahead with the eyes of faith. Just a chapter back, the author of Hebrews claimed that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Just like static electricity, we may not see it, we may not understand it, but on a dry winter day, it is, it is certainly there. And Paul's perseverance is legendary. Writing, man, we are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed and confused, but we're not driven to the point of despair. We are persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, yes. We get knocked down, but then we get up again. We are not destroyed. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise up us also. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Paul said. Paul also wrote about self-disciplined athletes who had faithfully trained and run with determination to win a little wreath of laurel leaves that was given to the winner back in that day. As followers of Christ, we practice self-discipline and determination not to win a little leaf wreath that is going to dry and curl up and be thrown away, but we will be crowned with an imperishable wreath. Back in the first century, Christians practiced what was considered kind of a, a strange custom. They would go down to their cemeteries carrying laurel wreaths, the, the same kind that were used to, to crown the winners of their athletic events. And they would use them 
to decorate the graves of Christians, celebrating their, their faith that in Christ, death had been conquered and the faithful would receive wreaths that would, would never fade. People put wreaths out in our cemetery all, all the time, but it never occurred to me that the meaning was linked in this very idea. So where are we in all of this? Are we running our own race, or are we intimidated by people who seem to be doing it better? Are we continuing to run the same old race without really considering if the purpose is valid for a new age? Are we focused on the work God has given us to do? Or are we constantly distracted by lesser things? Are we disciplined in our sacrificing and training for the race ahead? Are we persevering through the challenges and the setbacks? Are we confident in God's promises? Amen.